Today we are talking about Bibi and Louis Barron. Sure. When you think of electronic music, like they are very much at the forefront. Yeah. So uh, Bibi and Louis were in New York at the time when John Cage was in New York um, and had received his grant to make uh, the Williams mix, which is also considered right around the same time as Pierre Schaefer's train song. That's what I'm calling it. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. That we all was know what also you're about. music concrete. And so they were involved in that, which was really interesting to find out because. I did not set out to tie these things together. I just knew that I'd always, you know, wanted to dive deeper into their work. And when I did, I found like all these threads to the other people we've discussed, which well, was really interesting. They seemed to be very social, at least in the beginning, until they had to be like hermits with their work. But like, yeah, they, they were out and about. Um, I don't know how many times I've heard uh, BB explain that they every Friday night went to a bar and met with all the creatives, you know, that were hanging out in New York at the time, and that's where she paint met the scene for us. John Cage and and uh, Tudor and yeah, all. she mentions like uh, Stockhausen and um, you know Edgar Brace and people like that who were basically around. if people were in town. They anyone, went to this thing. anyone who was making tape music at the time, anyone who was doing electroacoustic music concrete, came through BB and Louis Barron's studio in New York, which was literally just an apartment. It was in a destination the spot, yeah. That they turned seemed. into a studio. Um, so let's take it back a little bit, or let's like I guess jump to the the punchline. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. What, what are, are they, they known, known for? for? That was not planned. How amazing is that? <laughs> Who are they and what are they known for? Uh, if you are familiar with the retro sci-fi classic film, uh, Forbidden Planet. If you're familiar with that movie, uh, Louis and B.B. Barron were the ones who made the first electronic movie score for that movie. But as I've been collecting this information, what seems to be the thread is this one author avant-garde artist that they met in California. When they first got married, they moved directly out to California. And it may be because they knew this person already. Anais Nin, she was, uh, she's credited as being an essayist. She's a novelist and a writer. And somehow they knew her in, in California. And because they knew her, they, everything stems from that. So the very first film that they scored um, you know, a lot of people say uh, Forbidden Planet is the first electronic film score, but they actually made electronic music very, very similar sounding uh, for a film that she did the, the spoken word for uh, called The Bells of Atlantis. They did first, like three films before they... They did three experimental yeah. short films. But she, everything that I looked up, it's, she was the thread through it all. So she's the one who told them, go to New York and go to the artist club and meet John Cage, you know? Like yeah. she was the one, and I don't know how they knew her in the first place. But she's the through line for all of this. So because of her, they did music for film. And because they did this film, they were able to say, hey, we do music for film and got hired to do Forbidden Planet. They both studied music in college, and Louis was a ham radio enthusiast. It all seems, see, that's something all about I want to get into, <laughs> because I feel like if you understand, you know, what goes on with, like, you know, making a, a ham radio and, and operating it, um, I feel like that allows you to understand a lot more uh, about what's going on with audio circuitry in general. The thing that seems to be the most important aspect to their work and sort of the, the turning point and the theme of it all is this book called Cybernetics. It sort of has a sci-fi sort of uh, mythology to it. And if you're looking um, for that on the web, I've found that it has a much longer title. It's, it's Cybernetics hyphen, uh, Col colon? colon. <laughs> or control and communication in the animal and machine, in the machine. The author, Norbert uh, Wiener, um, I think he was out of MIT. He um, was a math prodigy. Math prodigy. It seems like he discovered the basis for so many modern technologies, um, you know, and what they were outlined this? in this book. It was first put out in 1948. 1948 is such a pivotal year. Uh, one of the things that I found really interesting was that um, he even alluded to the idea of what uh, led to digital audio, like taking like a, 
uh, fluctuating um, analog source and translating it using uh, ones and zeros. You know, that's the, the basis for digital audio and that's in there. Um, I think he also touches on like, you know, something that, you know, basically is now considered a capacitor. Um, and he talked about, you know, rapidly like charging and discharging of many of these, you know, things, you know, which is basically how, um, you know, random access memory works. Um, you know, so, which is, you know, sort of the foundation of modern computers and, you know, so he just like kind of laid out a lot of these really high tech sort of concepts. You know, BB constantly said that Louis was the circuit guy, you know, and so he would, you know, take these circuits, you know, that were designed, you know, basically examples of, you know, these logic and communication type circuits. circuits. Yeah. yeah. And, and he would make them and then run them through an amplifier. And that was, you know, how they got their audio sound. Uh, so that was kind of like the, the thing that they found most interesting about these circuits was that, you know, it allowed you to sort of generate these random uh, pulses, which when amplified, you know, made these, you know, super, you know, random and weird uh, squeals and, and bleeps. And they would take them and record them. And, you know, basically they would build these circuits and they would die really quickly because they overloaded them. And like, they were basically doing all the wrong things. But kind um, of intentionally. But kind of intentionally. And they would record as much as they could. You know, they just, they had rooms of tape uh, that they acquired and they would record as much as they could from these devices. And then they would manipulate the tape. They would make loops, they would slow down, they would speed up, they, you know. And it's sort of the nature of the equipment too that gives it the character of the sound because it was what we would consider like too low tech. Uh, the kinks hadn't been worked out. They were unreliable and unstable. Uh, you know, they couldn't really get, they couldn't control things as, as much as we obviously can control every aspect and of everything. They didn't want now. to. And they didn't want to control yeah. it. Um, they were sort of a, like social psychologists in that sense that they felt that these um, these circuits that they were building and the tools they were using were organic as as much as we are, and that they should have um, their own sort of free will. So, Which is the basis of cybernetics. Yeah. Cybernetics is considered self-regulating. Um, mechanisms so they were really into this concept of you know these circuits you know basically being their own having their own lifespan you know and like going through different stages of development um, on their own and it also this cybernetics book touches on artificial intelligence and you know so pretty much were, everything we're talking about today they were thinking about in 1948 which um, blows my mind. They they talk about, you know, being in the village in the 50s and how they were much more aligned with, like, poets and authors and dancers of the time rather than musicians. So they were kind of shunned from the music community because there were some issues with, like, the musicians' union and being replaced by electronic instruments and that sort of thing. And because mm. they weren't in the musicians' union at the time, but they did this score, they weren't allowed to be credited as musicians. So like, I believe it was up, it won an Oscar, but they weren't credited as doing the music. So they didn't get the Oscar. And so like, they never got any uh, monetary well, they never did another benefit film. from it either. And they did experimental stuff, but yeah, they were blacklisted. They, never, they were blacklisted. Yeah, that, from, I found that extremely interesting. From Hollywood, completely. So they got, they got in in this like very like they met a dude and he was like come make music for this film and it happened to be like the biggest film of the time and then that was it they were blacklisted completely because of the fact that they were using electronic elements and uh, they were it well was it's very almost like he had to you know when when he made the decision to work with them I'm sure that it caused sort of like an uprising in you yeah know, there were like lots of secret meetings that were discussed about having whether or not they should be allowed into the union or not um there were secret meetings about what to call the score it ended up being referred to as electronic tonalities instead of electronic music whenever they were in music circles they were like the ones who weren't academics 
And if anything, they, they were threatening drive. because they were using electronics. Right, and, like it's almost like they were considered like imposters. Like how dare you be so influential and innovative when you're not an academic? And you're not, you which know, they, they, they were called that not even musicians. That some of their contemporaries were using test equipment to make sound. But I, re I heard some, BB said in one interview, she's like, there wasn't even a sine wave generator when we were doing this. It was all about the, you know, I guess creating the, the signal generators and things, you know, were, that was part of the thrill for them, you know? So if they weren't creating it, then it kind of like didn't count almost as a... Yeah, they really only used things that they built. That they built, Really, it was right. Louis, yeah. So Louis was, was taking these circuits that were designed in the cybernetics book and, and using them for music instead. And then they would kind of spend a lot of time kind of with the idea of what it was and building it and seeing what would happen. And then a lot of times it wouldn't even work. And then they would just move on to the next thing. It and does say <laughs> that they, um, you know, the sounds that they used, the tonalities were generated from a ring modulator. Oh, so they had a ring modulator. So they did build a circuit. But I think that the ring modulator it like, was called that, but method, you know, was kind of the that was what the circuit ended up being. It wasn't that they intentionally made a right. ring modulator. They actually had no idea what these circuits were gonna do, even as they were using them. So basically they would build the circuits, they didn't know what they were gonna do, they would record it to tape, probably just let that run all night, wake up in the morning, do some splicing, do some processing, and that's what it was. Yeah, they, they let liked... it be what it was, and if they heard something that sounded right for the scene that they were scoring, then they would use it. I think they called like delay and reverberation the same thing. I don't know if they used like you know spring reverb. But everything was mechanical, you know, like so there was it's no. All those tubes. Yeah, but they, I think that they refer to reverberation as what we now call delay. Hmm. So to them, the the tape delay, like feedback, you know the short of the delay time or whatever, like a really short delay with a lot of feedback would be considered reverberation. Mm, okay. Um, so that even seems the to be terms, the only yeah. effect that they used, really. It was just like, you know, it was, it was a ring modulator that was randomly spitting out uh, sounds and a, you know, reverberation, which is just a tape delay to them. You know, that's pretty much all they were using. And that's what it, I mean. It does sound like that. It's yes, just, it's, it's got just that a very primitive unique, sound. It's got a, it's just a very unique flavor of it. Mm -hmm. They did say that you know a lot of the techniques were developed when they were working with John Cage. So going back to that, actually, um, they met him through this artist's night at the bar, um, and he was given a grant uh, for a year to work on sort of like, I think it was like the exploration of sound. It was very vague. Uh, someone gave him a grant. It was an architect. It was an architect called Paul Williams, actually. Um, and he had known, Louis and Bibi had the only recording studio for avant-garde music at the time in New York. They were part of the team that got the grant. And so uh, what they were doing was uh, creating this thing called the Williams Mix, which was, you know, early music concrete, one of the first. So the techniques and the ideas, so they said that they were hired as sort of like the engineering assistants to create the found sounds, to record them. So they had like four categories of sounds that they were supposed to create, which was like city sounds, country sounds, some, some other things. Um, so they, would, they recorded the sounds and then um, they said they had, you know, tapes, just, you know, loops and things hanging all over their apartment. And John Cage was there um, splicing and, and kind of, he was making those decisions about, you know, what it was going to end up being and how it would go together. But they said they would put it in all kinds of orders and actually let, like, the randomness was part of it too. They would put the loops or the splices in random orders. Uh, and I think that's a lot of where they learned and then processing it, obviously. He is, you know, the reason they even knew to do any of that uh, with the tape. Um, I think they were just sort of getting into the idea of using a tape recorder and weren't really sure what to do with it, but they had the they idea. They had one of the first tape recorders made in the United yeah, States. Yeah, they had one of the they first. Were, it was made to order. So many times. It was made custom for them. Mm -hmm. um, 
And they had the idea that maybe this is for more than just recording, that you could do manipulation. But John Cage is the reason, I think, that they developed those techniques, which then into. led to you know them being able to... So in a way, it's almost like they were his source material. Yes. Like he was yes. the composer. Absolutely. And they were his sample bank. But because he They was, called them samples too, right? Yes, that's right. They called... Uh, even what they created for Forbidden Planet, samples, which I'm not sure that anybody was using that term at that point. What would that have even meant? It's another common thread that I've noticed, um, you know, with a lot of the early tape musicians is that they regretted when things started moving fast. Yeah, when the synthesizer it, came It's a into very play. slow art form. It's very painstaking. And when things became less painstaking and more um, fast moving um, and sequence, you know, sequencers and all that stuff came into play. And everything become, became easier. And it became more of a mainstream demand to have electronic music involved in commercials. And when TV, it became more popular, um, when it be, and you know, in the eighties it, you know, was, you know, had yeah. taken over pop music. Yeah. It became the mainstream for the first time, really. Um, they kind of, they kind of hated it. They did. I mean, it seems to be a common theme that anyone who's worked really hard for a long time manipulating tape, when synthesizers came on the scene, they didn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, it became less of an art it, form. And I think it's probably because they were equated as being the same thing or part of, you know, electronic music is whatever you were doing before with tape and synthesizers. It's all the same thing. But it's not. And I don't think that was something that was conveyed very well. At the time, maybe more now we understand that, um, but because we called what they were doing electronic music and we call what we're doing now with modular synths and keyboards and things as electronic music, they get lost in that because that's not really what they were doing. Except they said that if they did use a synthesizer... Ah, yes. Of course we feel validated in this. It would be a Buchla. Yeah, they were exposed to Buchla, uh, I guess in the late 70s, early 80s, and felt that if they had used any synthesizer, that would be the one, which probably is because of what you were talking about earlier with its um, the random. more random. I know one of the first things they did before they even got into making electronic music, which I thought was really interesting that, that it wasn't equated to this, but they had been given a, a, a wire recorder uh, as a wedding gift, which is an odd wedding gift, and I'm curious why someone would think that they would want it, but it is perfect for them. Uh, they were given a wire recorder and they were both, you know, had studied music in college and they got married and they moved out to California and they talk about how they had no way of making money. You know, no relation to today's world whatsoever. Um, they didn't know how to make money as musicians, they didn't know anybody, um, but they knew this one woman, Anais Nin, and she was an author. And so they used the wire recorder and then, you know, pretty quickly after that got a tape recorder. Uh, to record authors reading their own works and sort of, you know, spontaneously speaking about ideas as well, which is like, okay, that's the first audiobook. But I didn't hear anybody say that that's what it was, but she said no one was interested in it. But they have all these recordings, someone has them. This is the other thing is, I want to find out who's got the archive of all this, because she, I heard her in an interview say that she has everything they've ever done. Um, and I think well, their son has it, but like, who has it? I want it out. Somebody needs to put all this stuff out. But there's but recordings of for years, Henry, Louis had Henry it, right? Miller and Aldous Huxley and, you know, people like that, that they were like, oh yeah, we knew these people in, out in California and they, they read their books for us and we recorded it to tape, but nobody wanted to buy it. Louis had it for a long time, she said, like at his place. And then well, she says she has an archive of everything. He had a studio in... He had a studio, so he, he had the equipment. He had all the equipment, so all the equipment that they used... And a lot that of it got damaged built. after he passed away in the Northridge earthquake. Yeah, so it was at his house. They had they had gotten divorced, so he was remarried. Uh, he lived, I guess, somewhere in the Northridge area, and during we that earthquake... That yeah, so close. it got it was close enough that it got damaged. Mm -hmm. So a lot of his equipment was damaged in that earthquake. But she has the archive, so they do have a son together who is the steward of all this now. But uh, he mentioned, you know, briefly, and I don't know, this was maybe two thousand eight, that no one seemed interested in any of it. But we are. 
Yeah. We would like it to exist. We would like to have access to it. I'd love to hear. She said that they had a lot of tape recording. They just recorded everything. They recorded their lives, basically. So they would have parties. You know, she said Joseph Campbell was at one of their parties just before he became who he is now. You know, laughing, talking. Singing songs singing, from his college yes, singing years. college songs. Um, I, I want to hear all that stuff. To me, that's, you know, our... The history that I yeah. find interesting is people don't know that they're going to be influential or famous being caught in real moments and hearing that on tape. And then, gosh, if we could make music out of it. Exactly. Another thing that I did after, you know, they were blacklisted from Hollywood is that they scored, made scores for theater, plays and ballet and things like that, um, which I think she also has those. I read somewhere she did, uh, they did a score for a Gore Vidal play. Um, also, they got pigeonholed into doing outer space music, so he was doing some sort of outer space play, and it was turned into a movie, and they wouldn't let them do the score for it, even though it was like a smash success on Broadway, or off-Broadway, or wherever it was, um, that they couldn't even do the score for that film, even though they had made it for the play. You know, there's there's not as much to talk about outside of Forbidden Planet, because that is so well documented. Um, and Baby did mention, you know, as much as they enjoyed all the other work they did, nothing had... Oh, yeah. Nothing that was, had that breakthrough worldwide audience that, was the that, limelight that film did. For them, especially because yeah. it was the golden age of Hollywood at the time. Um, and in a way, it was sort of like the limelight for all avant-garde musicians at the time. Like they made it bigger than yeah anybody really. That's a really good like, point. At the time, yeah. I mean, nobody. They, I mean, they're the really the only ones. Yeah. Who, did, who crossed over into film? But all their other work, like I said, like she's got them, and there's some kind of archive that somebody has of their later work. Um, they made apparently they made an album for vinyl together, like much much later. Uh, that, again, she says, nobody cares about that. No one's heard it. So there's all this stuff that I would love to hear, but we I don't know who has it. That's sort of where I've been left, the mystery and the intrigue and the desire to hear the rest of their stuff and kind of the curiosity that I do find a lot of information and articles and interviews and things of people wanting to talk to them about Forbidden Planet, but there's not as much about the other stuff. And I think that they had a lot to say outside of just, oh, we made, you know, yes, of course, we're famous for this one thing. But they had a lot of, you know, philosophies that I found, they're very interesting to listen to, you know. There's this interesting tidbit as well in her later years, um, after Louis passed, she was invited to create a new work at UC Santa Barbara. Um, and the professors there taught her like the latest what it says, sound generating technology. Uh, she was taught, you know, she was basically caught up to date with uh, the technology for electronic music. What she it doesn't used. say what she used, but it just says that the sounds that she collected there were imported into Digital Performer on the Mac and organized to create her final work called Mixed Emotions. She also founded the Society for Electroacoustic Music in the United States in the 80s. Um, so she stayed very active um, building community and learning about what was going on even even though they wanted things to stay tube based but you couldn't get tubes anymore so from the sound examples that i've heard they sound like nothing else you're going for like unruly like <laughs> analog to the max Maybe there's a good bit of noise, you know, that you're dealing with, you know, it's not going to be a super clean signal, you know, circuitry that's like alive, you know, it, there's something about, you know, the combination of tubes and tape. Yeah. That's just like... Very it's noisy like, also. It's like 3D. Um, thank you for joining us at another Cosmic Conversation. Have a great week. Yeah, have a great week, everybody. Stay cosmic, stay tuned in. We'll be... Uh, Looking forward to talking to you more in the group.